Hello everyone, welcome back to your online learning. I hope you had a good uh, midterm break there. Very cold. I'm glad that the snow is starting to thaw at the moment. It's very cold still, but I'm, I'm looking forward to springtime arriving. So I hope you guys had a good, good break and were able to relax. So we are starting a new key area today. Before the break, you completed the first key area, ecosystems, and now we're going to start key area two, distribution of organisms. So in this uh, second key area, I've divided it into kind of three parts. First part, biotic and abiotic factors. We'll look at what these are, define them, and we're going to look at sampling and measuring them. We'll also look a little at interactions between them, more specifically biotic factors. We're going to look at identifying organisms and indicator species. So this is kind of an outline of what the key area to involves. There is in the file area of Teams the workbook which I would like you to download. In the workbook there are 30 gap fill tasks, 30 gap fill uh, sections which you need to complete. You can do this while listening to the video or later on you can download the PowerPoint and go through at your leisure, at your own pace. But there are 30 gap fills that you need to complete. Please, if you're going to uh, use the Word documents, remember to download that. Do not edit the online Word document. Some other classes were doing this and they edited the original document which kind of messed it up for other students. So if you're going to use the Word document to edit directly to that, download a copy and then uh, complete the gap fill tasks. There will also be a PDF document which you can refer to and that you cannot edit. In the workbook, you've got um, the you know, learning outcomes here. This is good. I always advise you guys to read this. It's the same as when you read a book. You read the contents page just to see the different sections. Sometimes I skip skip that, the contents page, but it's a very good idea just to see what the representation of the book or this key area is so it kind of helps uh, the schema in your brain and outline what it is you're going to be doing. You're very much same as if you're traveling somewhere you've never been before, you might look at a road map just to see what the, what the different uh, landmarks are that are going to help you get to the end, get to your destination. So this is the main information here and you will need this for the assessment. You also have your learning log. You should have used this for the first key area. Key area two, you have um, more kind of learning outcomes here. Remember the T part, you can tick that off to say you've been taught this and the RR is for uh, review and revise. So you can tick that off once you're, you're feeling confident with that. Okay, so the first section we are looking at is the biotic and abiotic factors. Remember, these are s certain factors or variables that can affect the distribution of organisms within an ecosystem. Uh, organisms will only want to live in areas where the biotic and abiotic factors suit them. For example, the right temperature or the appropriate amount of moisture or competition. So firstly, biotic factors. Biotic factors are the living variables in an ecosystem. You're all doing biology, so you should uh, know that bio is for the living, associated with living things. Examples of biotic factors are disease. Uh, some students overlook this, they think they consider disease as abiotic, but remember it's biotic. Disease is uh, generally uh, caused by living things such as bacteria or fungi. And you have this picture here. You also have competition for resources. You have a picture here of two squirrels. You have the red squirrel or Eurasian squirrel and the grey squirrel. And we know these are competing in the UK. The grey squirrel, com squirrel comes from North America 
and it's considered an invasive species. Also predation, the eagle here hunting, looking for fish, grazing, we have the cattle here, sheep and cows, and food availability. Competition for resources, food availability you should have covered in key area one, so it shouldn't, shouldn't be too uh, new that, you should have reviewed that before. Um, just going back to these squirrels, I saw an article the other day, it was talking about uh, the UK government carrying out birth control for grey squirrels, it was quite interesting. So this is a, a project of using oral contraceptives to control these grey squirrel populations because of the damage they and other invasive species are, are causing. It's interesting to know that invasive species to the UK woodlands costs the UK £1.8 billion pounds a year. £1.8 billion. That's quite a lot of money, so there is, you can see there's research, there's work, people are needed in wildlife conservation in the UK, and that's a lot of money, so if you guys are interested in going into work like that in the future, there's definitely uh, stuff to be done in the UK. So first, looking at predation, this is the eating of one organism by another. You can, we can see that the zebra here, if you're UK, or zebra, if you're from America, so predators are carnivores, they kill their prey. The number of predators in a population is closely tied to the size of its prey population. Predation can have uh, a big effect on bi biodiversity because predators keep down the numbers of their prey. This may reduce damage to plants by grazing and reduce competition between prey species. So we're going to look at a classic example of predator-prey interaction. don't know if you can recognize these two animals here. The first one on the left is the snowshoe here and we have the Canadian lynx. So we're using this example to show that the number of predators in a population is closely tied to the size of its prey population. You have this data here. So quite often in uh, the exams you're going to have to interpret graphs and tables. This graph is showing the snowshoe here population in the green lines and the orange is the Canadian lynx and it's from 1845 to 1925 and we have a number of animals. So this is considered a classic study. It was carried out 200 years ago by trappers working for the Hudson Bay Company which was once heavily involved in the fur trade. So in the early 20th century records of the Hudson Bay were analysed by a biologist from England called Charles Gordon Hewitt and he graphed the data for the records. Okay, so I would like you to look at this data here. I'm just going to give you maybe 30 seconds. Can you see any uh, relation between the snowshoe here population and the Canadian lynx? Okay, how the lines go up and down, the populations, how are they related? We're going to look at this data. It's, it's got some points uh, recorded on it, so it will be a bit easier to interpret. It shows you here that the snowshoe here <coughs> population increased. So when it increased, there was a small time delay showing an increase in the lynx population. So when the snowshoe here population increased a wee bit after the lynx population also increased. So this is showing that uh, the hare is the prey of the Canadian lynx. 
it also shows that this increase in the lynx uh, population here is an increase. This caused a little bit after the hare population to decrease. So when the lynx increased in numbers, a bit after the rabbit population decreased. Okay, and you can see again it increased a little bit after the decrease. Lynx increases in numbers, a bit after uh, the rabbit population decreases. So this is because of more predation. As a result, the reduced number of lynx. So when you see the lynx here decreasing, this allowed the hare population to increase afterwards. So when there was a, a re reduction in the Canadian lynx numbers, they're going down. This is allowing the snowshoe rabbits to increase again which again results in increased predation afterwards. So a large number of snowshoe rabbits is allowing the Canadian lynx population to increase and, and hunt these rabbits. <coughs> so looking at the, the predator-prey interactions, a summary is prey populations will increase in response to a decrease in predator populations as less prey are being eaten. We've got another graph here just showing this. The blue line is rabbits, which are the prey of the wolves, which are orange. So we can see the prey population here is increasing when the predator numbers are going down. So the predator, the wolf numbers go down. This is allowing the preys to increase. Predator populations will peak following a peak in prey population as there is more food for the predators. So you can see here there's a peak in the wolf population, which is following a peak in the prey population. So lots of food here for the wolves. So it's like a high, high number of wolves. In response to this peak in predator populations, prey populations will decrease as more prey are again eaten. So this peak in the wolf population meaning lots of these rabbits are getting eaten so it's going down and down and down which results in less food for predators so their populations will decrease so less rabbits this is affecting the wolves so their population is going down another uh, relationship we're looking at here is grazing so grazing is a term used to describe animals feeding on continuously growing plants and this can affect plant species diversity. Too little leads to dominant plants out competing other species. Too much grazing reduces its species numbers overall so this would be over grazing. Moderate grazing leads to a high level of biodiversity. So if you're under grazing here diversity, moderate grazing quite high diversity and over grazing again is reducing the intensity. I've got some pictures to show this. This is an enclosure with zero grazing. There's quite a lot of plants here. Light grazing, see the effect. Moderate grazing and then heavy grazing. So what does this mean for the populations? So biotic factors such as predation, grazing, competition, they affect the size of populations within an ecosystem. And remember, a population is a group of living organism, organisms of the one type, for example, rabbits or dandelions. So why is this important? Well, we're going to be uh, studying populations. And if we're studying a population, we will need to measure the different populations. One way we could measure the population of organisms in an ecosystem would be to collect and count all of the organisms. So we could collect all of the organisms here. 
Do you think that is realistic? I hope you are all seeing. No, definitely not. We are not going to count all the daffodils or buttercups in a field. Why? This would be very difficult and time consuming. So instead of this, we carry out sampling. Sampling allows estimates to be made of the population sizes and habitats. An estimate of population size can be obtained by taking samples. We take many samples and then we calculate an average. So there's going to be a little bit of maths involved here. It's important to take a lot of samples and then we calculate an average. So, things to keep in mind. Sampling must be representative of the whole area. Sampling sites must be selected randomly to prevent selection bias. And the number of samples must be large enough to be reliable. This reduces the effect of any extreme or atypical results when an average is calculated. Okay, so we're going to look at this for some different methods, but this is this is going to be repeated a little. So the first thing we're looking at uh, is the use of quadrats. A quadrat can be used to sample plants and animals that do not move or move very little. So we see here is a quadrat used on grass, on land, and quadrats are used underwater. So a quadrat marks off a small piece of ground and can be used to estimate the size of a population or show the distribution of plants in a larger area. Uh, the number of squares in the quadrat which contain each type of plant is counted. This is the abundance. So something you have to know with the use of these sampling uh, techniques is how to minimize error. So quadrants should be thrown at random to eliminate bias. That means you not standing in the field and hmm, look at those bunch of daisies over there. They look you know, the ideal uh, group of plants to count. It has to be done at random. So you're throwing the, the quadrant at random. You have to carry out several samples and calculate averages uh, to increase reliability. And you have to think about as well of a consistent in or out rule which must be applied for plants occupying more than one square of at the outer edge. So make sure you're applying, if it's half in or out, you're going to apply that rule all the time. Half in, you, do, you can apply the same rule when you're using your quadrants. I have this video here and it's going to talk about sampling strategies. Today we're going to be exploring various sampling strategies, including the use of quadrats. It's usually not possible to look at every single individual of a species within a given area. It's also pretty rare that you'll be able to look at every single square metre within that area too. For that reason, field ecologists try and obtain something called a representative sample. This is when you look at a smaller area uh, that represents patterns that are happening on a bigger scale. You might want to use a quadrat to do that, such as the ones down here. And quadrats are really useful because they can quantify that smaller area that we'll be looking within. They do come in all shapes and sizes, um, small and big, depending on how many you're going to place and the species that you're looking at. Um, often they're square shaped like these ones. They can be made of metal or plastic. This one is uh, an open frame quadrat. There's no grids inside this one, you can see. Whereas this one is divided into many more grids uh, and that's what we call a gridded quadrat. You can have lots of different numbers of grids. Sometimes they have five squares by five squares, giving you 25 in total. This one has 10 along the top and 10 down the side, giving us 100 in total, which can be really useful if we're working out things like percentage. When you place your quadrat on the ground, um, there's a number of things that you might want to do. Firstly, you might want to identify the species that you're looking at, either one that's particularly interesting or all of them, if you're looking more generally at biodiversity. In my example here, I'm just going to look at this small flower here, which is known as Bellis perennis, or otherwise known as daisy. I can see three individual plants here. 
uh, one of which has a flower, two of which just have the leaves. If I want to assess the abundance of that daisy, I could just count the fact that there are three plants within the quadrat. This gives me what's known as species density, the number of plants or other species in a given area. If you think of other species though, such as mosses or lichens or even corals that grow under the sea, um, they don't grow as individual entities uh, and for that reason we might need a different technique. I'm going to pop my uh, gridded quadrat over the top now and try a technique that involves percentage cover. In this technique I look at each square and if my species is present I, get, I count it and if it's not I don't. So in this case I've got Bellis perennis uh, present in one, two, three, four, five, six of my squares. That gives me a percentage cover of 6%. You may also want to use a pointer and these pointers can be used to place in a number of locations around your quadrat and see if the species touches or doesn't touch uh, your point. That can be quite useful um, because it's not based on opinion. The plant either touches that pin or it doesn't, but you can miss some species, particularly if they're small or if they're quite rare. It's not always appropriate just to place one quadrat within a given area. If you want to gain valid conclusions um, by improving your accuracy and precision, you might want to place a number of these uh, and take a mean or, or other averages. In my example behind me, I may want to be assessing the biodiversity in this small area of unmown grassland here. I may then want to compare that abundance to the area behind the fence in that grazed farmland there. So it's not possible for me in this example to look at every single individual within this area and then compare it to every single individual in this grazed farmland just over the fence here. So I'm going to be placing some of these quadrats but I'm going to do so in a random manner. That means that every area within this area has an equal chance of being sampled. Now I'm not just going to throw this quadrat down, I'm going to uh, use this random number table here. Uh, you can get these or generate them online and I'm going to be selecting one random number for my x-axis and one random number for my y-axis with the, my two tape measures and that will help me locate one location within this area. Let's have a go. So I'm going to close my eyes or look away and I'm going to point to my first random number. In this case it's 2.2 metres and I'm just going to mark that out with a small stick here. 2.2 metres just so I can see where that is and I'm going to go down the same column until I find a random number that's below 4 metres, which is the length of my y-axis. In this case, that's 1.8 metres. Uh, so 1.8 metres is exactly here. Now I've got my coordinates, I can find that exact one location, so I'm going to paste out from my marker here until I get to uh, the point on my x-axis and I'm going to place my quadrat down so that the left bottom left hand corner is exactly at that coordinate. And I'm now ready to identify and assess the abundance of species within this area. Of course I'd want to do this again uh, a number of times in this area and then do exactly the same thing on the other side to make my comparison. Sometimes it isn't appropriate to use a random sample such as this, there are other techniques. Sometimes people place quadrats along a line known as a transect and that can be really handy when you're trying to find out the influence of something that changes gradually. For example, the tree in front of me is casting shade on the ground and I might be interested in how that shade affects plants moving away from the tree, assuming that light will increase as you get further away from the tree. So in this case, I might want to place my quadrat um, every maybe two metres as you go away from that tree. In this way, we're placing our quadrat uh, at equal intervals along that line, and this is known as a systematic sample. Systematic samples can be quite useful, especially when you've identified a, a gradual change within the environment, such as changing light, such as under this tree, or it could be something like increasing soil moisture as you get closer to a pond too. Sampling techniques like this are pretty essential if you do want to get valid results within your investigation um, and to ensure accuracy and reliability. <clears throat> okay guys, so I hope you found that video uh, useful. I think so because 
we are not able to do uh, these sampling strategies at the moment so I think it's good just to see how they're carried out so we're another uh, sampling method is using pitfall traps so the quadrat was for non-moving or very slow moving things uh, I like to, for, they mentioned the coral which is an animal under the sea some people think coral is a plant but it's an animal now we're looking at pitfall traps which are used for small animals moving across the surface of a piece of soil or ground these are commonly uh, commonly invertebrates such as beetles spiders wood lice and worms and <coughs> With my third year class, we did this earlier in the year, so I imagine you guys got to do this last year. You might not have, depending on the the weather, but with my class, we went outside and we made some pitfall traps. So again, what do you have to take into account to minimize errors? You have to make sure the trap is level with the soil surface to ensure the animals fall in. It's a pit to fall trap, not a pit climb up and fall in trap. So I think some of my students earlier made mistakes with this. They didn't uh, dig deep enough, or there was rocks stopping them from placing their container in the soil. So the, the invertebrates had to climb up. So that's going to affect your result. Your results has to be in line. You have to cover the top of the trap with a raised covering, such as leaves or bark, to hide the trap, camouflage it from predators which is going to stop them being eaten so some birds might think that's some easy food so try and cover it obviously do not cover too much if you cover it too much then the animals uh, aren't going to fall in you have to check the traps regularly to avoid organisms eating each other or the birds <coughs> uh, just eating everything as well coming down if it's getting kicked over check it regularly Again, with one class we did 24 hours, which is a good period, I'd say. Another class we set up on the Friday, and I think we had problems, so we didn't get back until Tuesday. That was a bit too long, so try and do it, I think, 24 hours is a good time period. You need drainage holes at the bottom to prevent the traps flooding. Uh, it's obviously common with the high rainfall we have here in Scotland. We don't want to uh, kill the drown the little vertebrates that are in your trap. Ensure the trap has steep sides so it can't climb out and carry out again several samples and calculate average results to increase reliability. Okay, Another small mammal trap uh, can be used and this is called a Longworth mammal trap and this is for sampling small mammals in an ecosystem. Uh, it's important to remember that if you do capture a mammal it should be released exactly where it was caught. Here is a Longworth trap for trapping rodents. Here is the door where the rodent will enter and here is the main chamber where the rodent will stay until you empty the trap. So first of all have your inner tube this way around so that the ridges are at the top and have this part this way around. Now hold the lip back and hold the catch forward. Insert the tube and then put it out so that the lip catches this bit here, there. And as you can see, it's secure. Now open the door until it clicks at the top and your trap is ready to set. Inside the main chamber you would put some bait such as some seed and some bedding which is usually some dried moss and if you look inside the trap the catch at the back, the long wire, when the rodent steps on this this will trigger the door to close and you will have trapped your rodent. So this is a Longworth trap. Once you've set your trap remember to mark it with, as we're using, a post with something very recognisable at the top. This is important, otherwise you may not find your trap in the morning and this is important for the welfare of the rodents. <coughs> okay guys, so that's a Longworth mammal trap. Good to see how it works. Ok, 
Okay, now we're going to look at abiotic factors. So these are the non-living variables, the non-living factors that can influence where an organism is able to, to live. Examples include light intensity, soil moisture, soil pH, and temperature. Okay, so remember this is non-living things, things which are not living. And again, um, you can see from biotic living, abiotic, there's the use of this prefix here, the a, which comes from Greek, and it means not or without. So this gives the word the opposite meaning. So you can think of, I said before, atypical. So you have typical, atypical, not typical, or moral, amoral, or sexual reproduction, asexual reproduction, symmetrical, asymmetrical. So all abiotic means is non living. Uh, remember as well, maybe in the in the tests, if you're asked about these factors, always remember to use the correct terminology. So if you just write down light, that might be wrong, considered wrong. You have to include light intensity, soil moisture, try and use it the correct uh, terms. So abiotic factors, so a living organism is only able to survive in a certain habitat and play its part in an ecosystem if the correct combination of abi abiotic factors are present uh, and it suits its needs. Uh, things like uh, plants might only grow in areas with high light intensity. So you know green plants need to photosynthesize. They're going to have to live they'll need to live in an area where there's a good abundance of light. Uh, the next key area will be photosynthesis, key area three, so you'll learn a little bit more about that then. Uh, plants which live in areas of high light are called sun plants. You might have some in your house that need to be at the window. And you have shade plants which live in areas of low light intensity. Uh, think about woodlands or rainforests which have a canopy, different layers, you'll have different types of uh, plants which have evolved to grow in different uh, <coughs> amounts of light. Some animals such as wood lice will only be found in damp or dark environments. Wood lice here. Um, I read an article this morning I was want to share with you as well, it's really interesting. And it was, it was about researchers rethinking life in, a, in cold climates. So in the Antarctic, they found these very small mobile, uh, so immobile organisms at 1,000 meters, 900 meters, so nearly 1,000 meters. And they previously thought that these organisms can't live there. So they, they, they're aware that fish and worms and jellyfish and krill could live at that depth, but they've now found these immobile organisms which, which are stationary, they filter feed, and they survive by in, ingesting food that falls in them. So they can survive in total darkness, uh, very little food, and minus two degrees. So we are learning things all the time about new species. Well, they, they don't know yet whether these are new species or it could be one they've already identified, but that, that was just, that was uh, this morning. It was on, so it's quite interesting. Again, there are still lots of unidentified species on our planet. If you guys are interested in uh, going to a, a research career and finding out about these things, I think it's fascinating. So first thing, light intensity. This is a measure of the brightness of the light in an environment. As we said, some plants need full light, others grow better in the shade. Uh, we're going to use this little thing here, uh, which is a light meter. And you can see here, there's a little sensor. When, we're using a, when we use a light meter, again, to minimize error, we have to make sure that the light meter is held at the soil surface and pointed in the direction of maximum light intensity sure that shadows are not cast over the sensor of the meter. This includes shadow cast by the user. The user. So be careful where you stand. The sensor has to face the direction of the light and not 
point towards uh, the user when you when you take the reading. I don't know if you know this. There's a song by Oasis. I quite like "Cast No Shadow." That reminded me of that. But being careful not to stand over. Uh, have a look at that Oasis song, "Cast No Shadows." Uh, also, take all samples at the same time of day. If you're comparing different plants, you wouldn't sample one in the morning, go away, have a wee cup of tea, lunch and come back, it has to be all at the same time. And again, same as always, take a lot of samples and calculate the averages to make sure results are more reliable. Moisture. Some plants and animals need wet conditions and some need dry conditions. We're going to use this here, a moisture meter, which is used for can't, some moisture meters measure light and moisture, so I, I'm sorry that's got light in here. It might be just a moisture moisture meter that only records moisture. We have ones in the school which do both. And then here you have the probe at the bottom, which is placed in the soil. Be careful with these. I think some of the ones we have in the school as well, students have bent the probes. You just you have to be careful when you're using this equipment to minimize error. Wipe the probe each before each reading to make sure it's clean and dry. Push the probe carefully into the soil to the same depth for each measurement. I think around five centimeters, but it will depend on the probe. But it should be about five centimeters. Uh, as always, take several readings and calculate an average to make results more reliable. pH. This is a measure of the acidity or alkalinity. The environment. The high rainfall in Scotland causes many areas to have acidic soil. Some plants do like acidic soil. Um, heather, rhododendrons, azaleas, they all grow well in acidic soil. However, plants like lavender uh, prefer an alkaline so soil. Uh, some acidic conditions do lead to the destruction of soil nutrients which make it harder for plants to absorb water but as I said some plants do prefer acidic uh, soil. Some plants will even look different depending on the pH of the soil uh, they are grown in. We have this plant here which is hydrangeas, 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 okay so again it's quite tricky these words if you see that here it's hydrangeas and the stresses on the second syllable, hydrangeas. So these hydrangeas uh, can have different colours, pH 4.5, they have a deep blue. Going up towards 6 is a purple pink colour and then at 7 there's a deep pink. So these species kind of indicate the pH of the soil. So we're going to come back to indicators later on but I think that's quite interesting the different colors which are produced so when we're taking pH measurements we use a pH meter here again you have a probe to minimize error wipe before each reading to make sure it's clean and dry push the probe into the soil at the same depth for each measurement and take several readings and calculate the average same as always don't forget that part there temperature this is the measure of how hot or cold the environment is Many plants and animals are adapted to live in hot or cold uh, temperatures. Plants which like the cold are pansies or snapdragon. Or you have trees like evergreens, spruce trees, pine trees, oak trees. They all like they grow well in cold environments. And then you have things like cacti, which like the hot environment. Uh, and the air temperature is measured using a thermometer. Soil temperature is measured using a temperature probe. To minimize error, leave the thermometer or probe in an area of soil for a sufficient length of time to acclimatize before taking readings. If you're measuring soil temperature, place soil thermometer into the soil at the same depth each time. And again, take several readings and calculate an average to make results more reliable. And always remember to carefully clean the probe afterwards to ensure any leftover moisture or soil does not contaminate the results. Okay guys, so well done. That is around 40 minutes now. If you would like, take a little break and you can come back and 
look at the next part of the video which is um, identifying organisms I'd say have a be breaking out okay so identifying organisms so once you've used your quadrat or pitfall trap you'll need to identify the organism to do that we use biological keys so these biological keys are used to identify living things there are two types one is called the branching key and another one is paired statement keys so you were first going to have a quick look at branching keys so the branching key is often in a series of questions about the organism and the questions are answered by looking closely at it. The question finally leads to the name of the organism. So we're going to look at uh, these animals here. We're looking at vertebrates. So vertebrates are animals which have a backbone. Invertebrates don't have a, have a backbone. Invertebrates are things like soft-bodied animals with worm, like worms or jellyfish or ones that have hard outer casings covering the body like spiders and crabs but we're looking at vertebrates here and the first question here would be does it have fur yes or no so if it has fur you can say it's a mammal no fur we're going to have another question here does it have feathers if it has feathers it's a bird so you've got all these questions which you can go down and you can identify the, the main groups of Vertebrates, bird, reptile, fish, and amphibian. Uh, we have also invertebrate branching keys, or sometimes called mini beasts. But remember, in biology, we try and use the, the correct terms. It should be invertebrates. And you've got ones here. It's, has it got wings? Has it got a shell? And we can identify different uh, invertebrates. You have a centipede, spider, moth. Some branching keys can be very, very complicated. You've got this one here to, uh, for mature earthworms found in Canada. So you've got lots of very, very specific questions here. So you have to really look at the organism. <coughs> Another one to look at is the paired statement key. So a paired statement key is a numbered list of statements. So you look at the organism and you decide which of the first two statements fits it best. So you've got some birds here, bird W, X, Y, and Z. And you've got the beak is relatively long and slender. It tells you the name. Or the beak is relatively, relatively stout and heavy. Go to number two. At the end of each statement, this number signifies which statement to use next. And the numbers are followed until the name of the organism found. So if you want you can try and name these birds. Pause the video. These keys are generally worded very carefully to avoid confusion over characteristics. So you have to be careful again. I think same as anything in any test or exam, always just go back and check your answers very easy just to make a, a lot of mistake when you're reading these always just double check everything so let's look at one of these this is a sample past paper question of a paired statement key I wonder if anybody can recognize this organism here so it's an anthropod anthropods include insects crustaceans arachnids and they're characterized by a chitinous exoskeleton so remember chitin along with cellulose is one of the most important biopolymers in nature so if you're unable to to name this we saw centipedes before so some of you might already be thinking oh that's a centipede and it's interesting to know that centipede does mean 100 feet however usually they have no more than 40 to 50 legs so this is a centipede but what is its uh, specific name so again pause the video and I would like you to tell uh, can't tell me but write down what you think the name of this uh, organism is ok 
Okay, so you should have all got down to this one here. Now I've heard this pronounced as Chilopoda or Kylopoda. I'm going with Kylopoda because it's from Chitin. But it could be Chilopoda. Some of these words are pronounced differently. But yes, if you look here, number one, six legs, more than six legs, definitely more than six legs. We're going to go to number two. Eight legs or more than eight legs. Yep. More than eight legs. We go down to number four. And does it have one pair of legs per body segment or two? We can see here in each body segment is one pair. One pair in each. So this is the Kylopoda. Okay. In your workbooks, there's some more uh, examples of these. I'm not going to work through this now. I would like you guys to work through it at your own pace. And I will post the answers into the file. So try this in your own time. First one is starfish, and take your time, try this at your own pace. There's another one here as well, this one for plants, again, try this one and check with your answers, yeah. <coughs> which I will post in the, the file area. Okay, last section now, we're going to look at indicator species. Indicator species are organisms that are, by their presence or absence indicate the level of pollution in environments. So we saw before that the, the plant which kind of indicated the pH and we can have other organisms which tell us about the air or, or water pollution. So we look first at water pollution. The level of pollution in water can be indicated by the species present. Fresh water invertebrates have different sensitivity to dissolved oxygen concentrations. Fresh water can become polluted with organic waste such as sewage. Uh, organic waste acts as a food supply for aerobic bacteria. So we know aerobic means it uses up oxygen. So these invertebrates living in the water also depend on, on oxygen. So if you have lots of bacteria using the oxygen up, it's going to uh, reduce the, the level of oxygen. So unpolluted water contains lots of oxygen, polluted water contains lower levels. If the number and species of certain invertebrates living in fresh water changes, this could be an early indication of pollution. So we have these fresh water indicators here. We can see low level of pollution. We have these nymphs such as stonefly or mayfly. So if you've got lots of these in the water, you'd be able to say, oh, there's a very low level of pollution. Going up from freshwater shrimp, water louse, blood worms, rat tailed maggot. These are the names getting more disgusting. Uh, and very high levels of pollution. Uh, you'll have things like rat-tailed maggots or sludge worms. So these will indicate that the water is polluted. For indicators of air pollution, we have these lichens. Just be careful. I think I used to call this lichens when I first saw this when I was younger. But again, these, the pronunciation would be quite difficult. I like using this as lichens. So the lichens are plants that grow in exposed places such as rocks or tree bark. They need to be very good at absorbing water and nutrients to grow there and rain water containing just enough nutrients to keep them alive. There are many different types of lichens, some of which tolerate polluted air and others which will only grow in areas of low pollution. As you can see here is the Bushy lichens need really clean air. Leafy lichens can survive a small amount of air pollution. Crusty lichens can survive in more polluted air. And then no lichens, that means it's been heavily polluted with sulfur dioxide. So I think this is this was noticed and studied during the kind of industrial revolution in big cities like Manchester and Glasgow. Where there's lots of kind of factory and lots of pollution that the numbers of lichens was reducing closer to these big factories. 
Okay, guys, that's it. That I just reached the end. You can see here just the last statement that lichens are natural indicators of air pollution. So, what you need to know. So, for key area two, distribution of organisms. Make sure you read through this. And that is everything. Please keep an eye out. I'm going to post some work uh, tomorrow, some extra exercises which you can look at, and we'll do a live lesson at the end of the week. Keep an eye out for postings of that. And thank you very much for listening. Take care, and all the best. Bye-bye.